I never had a Barbie. My mother didn't like them. I did play with other girls' Barbies, but I never really connected with the doll, much less the brand. But by the end of this film, I felt like I was a Barbie, because, duh, a Barbie could be me if she wanted to. And somehow, Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie had been playing with me. I felt like I'd been dressed in a half-man, half-woman costume, put in a hall of mirrors, and told and to point out my real self. Obviously, my favourite was Weird Barbie. Kate McKinnon is an anchor of sardonic sanity as that Barbie with the crazy makeup and badly scissored hair who spends half her time in the splits. The Barbie who's been played with too hard. I'm going to get right into this, but not just yet. Back it up, because there is a container load of unpacking to do here. First up, I beg you, do not come into the comments to tell me I'm overthinking this trivial bit of lipstick feminist fluff. We are taking a deep dive down through the semiotic layers, and if you don't like it, don't come. Just don't stray out of your depth to argue with me if you feel safer in the shallows. I only went to see this film because I needed to know how a pop culture blockbuster was featuring the P word, patriarchy. The law that generally dare not speak its name. The socioeconomic structure of our civilization. The hierarchy of rights and priorities our culture mostly insists is either so gone it's not worth mentioning, or so natural it's intrinsic, invisible, unchallengeable. That confused and confusing duality is present in the film in a dizzyingly refracted array. And we're not even talking gender yet. Absolutely the most twisted thing about this film is the hyper-layered presence of Mattel. In the real world within the film, in the actual Hollywood world that made the film, in the Barbie land of the film, and ultimately, implicitly, in the conceptual Barbie land of every little girl who plays with Barbie, and the interior world of all the women we grow into. The CEO and board of Mattel, depicted here as a cross between the Matrix's Agent Smith and the Keystone Cops, make the apex of Western patriarchy almost endearing. Meanwhile, Ken is wallowing in the badlands with beer and bogans, and Barbie must transcend both high and low manifestations of masculine mastery to truly realise herself. And for that, she'll need some human help. Help from someone, that is, who actually lays hands on her. There's a clue to the nature of her quest right there. But the point behind the point of all this, the thing that makes it all so madly, wildly postmodern, is that the idea of a Barbie film was Mattel's in the first place. This film could never have been made without Mattel, and the insouciant delicacy with which Gerwig and co-writer Noah Baumbach navigate a narrative in which the principal benefactor of the entire production is technically the villain of the story is nothing short of genius. Will Ferrell. Is that a clitoris and vulva between his black lapels? Does some fine clowning in the role the filmmakers called an allegory for corporate America. There's a throwaway moment when he pours all of capitalism's sententious, self-serving, smarmy, black-is-white, pseudo-social hypocrisy into the earnest, outrageous words, please call me mother. He almost succeeds in persuading Barbie to get back in her box, but the chase that follows her evasion of patriarchal reprogramming as a contented doll who knows what world she belongs in bails up against Barbie's own roadblock. Nothing is real, or if it is, it's mimetic, inconclusive, elusive. Even when they come face to face, the CEO of Mattel can't physically catch Barbie. And did you see how fast she decked the guy that slapped her ass? No one can hurt Barbie except the girl who plays with her. Not boyfriends, not babies, not the patriarchy itself. That's because Barbie isn't just a character, she's an archetype. But she's an archetype created within and by a patriarchal society, albeit one under challenge, hence her emergence. An archetype built, managed and maintained by an organisation that, in the movie, represents, in effect, the imperial patriarchal economy. Barbie's search for self-realisation will lead her to sacrifice her immortality for the world Mattel dare not show. The real women's world that patriarchy both constrains and exploits. The world of blood and babies, structural vulnerability and unspeakable violence. Every time the plot led to a violent encounter, the kid-friendly, acid-freak aesthetic veered off somewhere increasingly splendidly weird. Some sources have called Barbie land a matriarchy, but that is a big misnomer. Matriarchies are run by mothers. Actual matriarchies do exist, but they're a very different type of society from the sexless, saccharine showboat planet of Barbie land. 
Real matriarchies look nothing like this pink plastic parody of patriarchy, and frankly, only patriarchy could produce the perverse vapidity of this moulded princess province with no vaginas, no blood, no childbirth, no growing up, no ageing. Barbie land is no more a matriarchy than a fake tree factory is a forest. To clarify, Britain could have a queen, a female prime minister and an all-female cabinet, and it still wouldn't be a matriarchy, even if they were all mothers. It would be a gynaeocracy ruled by women, like in Barbie land. But no matter how progressive a government it was, or what changes it made to the standard capitalist democratic agenda, like, say, improving childcare subsidies, it would still be a bunch of women doing their best to humanise a masculine economy, a system set up from the get-go to privilege men and men's business, competition, expansion, exploitation and destruction. Money flows to and from these processes because it was invented to facilitate them and only begrudgingly does it fund the feminine business of cooperation, concession, nurture and creativity. Please don't at me on gender without first getting your head around this. Much of what we heap into the boxes we've labelled feminine and masculine is purely arbitrary, or rather related only distantly and contingently to the core realities of gender, which are the drives and behaviours that ensure human reproduction and survival. All of us are capable of most of it. Lots of us want to do all of it. Some of us tend more to the dynamics of the other sex, but the genitally gendered inclinations are strong enough across the species that there's really no reason to push anyone into any box. But the world that produced Mattel is built on those gender-defining boxes, and particularly on the masculine. Our world disdains vulnerability, wants to transcend the flesh, shields young girls from bodily knowledge, idealises, constrains, problematises and attacks the feminine. Bloody Barbie is a thing on the internet, but it's not Mattel's thing. So a Barbie movie really couldn't have been coherently feminist without weird Barbie. Played with too hard. The closest Mattel can go to acknowledging the chaotic bodily vulnerability of the feminine. And Gerwig grants her a sublime cynicism. But even Weird Barbie smartens up by the end, because after the pivotal monologue about how it's literally impossible to be a woman, they all have a major point to make. Fortunately, Barbie is an imperial champion, the impossible is her jam, and she is off to the real world to become an actual woman. Male protagonists are often chasing immortality. Female protagonists just want permission to be mortal. In ways that go beyond Ryan Gosling's scene-stealing, adorably funny, preposterously hot performance, the heart of this movie kind of belongs with Ken. Ken was made to be Barbie's consort, but in Gerwig's inspired rethink, she doesn't want him. How could Barbie not love Ken? It's like Adam not being into Eve. Not a flicker, no matter how Ken behaves. All the faux fur and swaggering in the world can't mask the sterility of his love. He's a sort of anti-heroine, the structurally static, passive foil to Barbie's hero's journey. When Barbie goes off to the real world the second time, she's looking for a real man, a man who can give her a baby. Ken cannot come. He remains a doll, trapped in the barren simulacrum Barbie is transcending. Barbie rejects Ken the way the hero of a Somerset Maugham novel rejects women of his own race and class, because love, as it's conventionally prescribed, is a pointless role play in a meaningless society, and a taboo must be crossed, the challenge of a foreign world embraced, to find the authentic experience. Millions of words have been written about Barbie by now, much of it as clever, thoughtful and funny as the film itself. It deserves the hype. It's a rare and brilliant subliminal strumming of the key structural dilemma of both feminism and the planet's future. The systemic entanglements of patriarchy and capitalism, humanism and transhumanism. And they do it without even mentioning the environment by focusing on the violent difficulty of bringing the reality of the body into patriarchal discourse. This film was always going to flail for a really satisfying resolution since it tangles with a dilemma in Western culture which at this point in history looks set to take us into catastrophic civilizational breakdown. Liberal feminism can't save the world. Even diversity won't help much now unless we radically restructure entire national economies dizzyingly fast. But that's outside Barbie's remit because ultimately Gerwig's movie is Mattel's movie. Barbie can hardly condemn the mass production of plastic toys. I loved it. It's hilarious 
exhilarating and immeasurably sad.